Have you ever met a conflicted farmer? Good afternoon. My name is Nathan Peltier. I'm a professor, I'm a father, and I'm a conflicted farmer. As a professor, my research focuses on the intersection of food and sustainability issues. As a father of two, I'm very much concerned with how my children eat and the connections that they have to food. And as a farmer, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted because I find myself in the rather awkward situation where my intuitions and my lifestyle choices with respect to food and farming are actually at odds with my professional knowledge, with the objective realities that my research and the research of others in my field are bringing to light. I like to describe this conflict with the hope that my perspectives can contribute to a very necessary reflection and a social discourse in which all of us must engage regarding our options with respect to the future of food and sustainability. So to begin, a question. Who cares about food? Of course, we all do. After all, food is clearly central to our well-being. It's central to our health, to our economies, to our cultures, often even to our individual identities. Accessing food of sufficient quality and quantity satisfies a basic human need, and for this reason is enshrined as a fundamental human right. We ought to care very much about food. And we ought to also care very much about the sustainability of how we produce and consume food. Why? Because food is also at the center of so many of our most pressing sustainability challenges. Activities in the food system together account for as much as 90% of our freshwater demands. Producing food occupies over 30% of the terrestrial surface area of our planet. For this reason, food production is a critical driver of biodiversity loss. It's responsible for the majority of nitrogen pollution and as much as one-third of greenhouse gas emissions. Nonetheless, looking forward in face of increasing competition for these scarce resources and the uncertainties of a changing climate, our food systems will be required to produce enough food to feed a population of over 9 billion people by mid-century, and perhaps as many as 12 billion by century's end. So what are our options in order to sustainably feed this growing human population? Back in the 1970s, a biologist at Stanford named Paul Ehrlich proposed an equation to describe the factors that together contribute to determining humanity's collective impact on the environment. Ehrlich suggested that our impact is a function of three interacting variables, population, affluence, and technology. And this provides quite a useful way to think about the sustainability impacts of how we produce and consume food, as well as what are the major levers that we might exploit in order to reduce those impacts. Let's consider each in turn, beginning with population. This is simply about how many mouths we have to feed. All else being equal, the more numerous we are, the more food we have to produce to sustain ourselves, the greater the impact. We are currently adding mouths to feed at a net rate of over 200,000 people every single day. But we don't talk about population, do we? Other than to acknowledge that we have to figure out how to support a lot more people in the future, population really is a proverbial elephant in the room. But even if we did choose to seriously address this variable, which requires opportunity for education and empowerment of women in developing countries. This is a long game. The second variable, affluence, refers to what and how much we consume. It's well established that with increasing affluence, we tend to see a shift towards diets that are higher in sugars, fats, refined carbohydrates, and animal products. 
And as the developing world continues to industrialize and the global middle class expand, this is precisely what we are seeing. Unfortunately, more affluent diets also tend to be less sustainable diets. Now this variable, we are a little bit more open to talking about. In the least, we are reasonably open to talking about personal food choices. Not so much public policy in the food space, but individual dietary choice. And clearly there is no end to dietary advice out there. Some of it concerned with sustainability. Of all the dietary advice that I've encountered, the most pragmatic comes from Berkeley professor of journalism and food writer Michael Pollan, who simply advises, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. From a sustainability perspective, that is solid advice. To which I would add, don't waste it. Globally, one third of the food that is produced for human consumption does not get eaten. In Canada, that number is 40%, and it's largely linked to food waste at the retail and consumer level. 40%. So this second variable is potentially very powerful in enabling us to reduce our impacts, but it requires that we accept to constrain our food choices and to change our food behaviors based on sustainability considerations, either individually through diet or collectively through food policy. And for many people, this turns out to be a surprisingly hard sell. The third variable that we have to work with is technology. In other words, how we produce food. Now, this is the one that everybody's comfortable talking about. And I suppose this isn't surprising. We are, after all, the technological species. We tend to default to seeking to solve our problems through technological means. What is somewhat surprising, however, is that when it comes to food, many of us as consumers are actually often less willing to put our faith in technology. Many of us are, in fact, anti-technological with respect to food, embracing instead a, a romanticized vision of the past as a preferred model for food production. Small scale, low intensity, localized production and consumption. Our comfort with the how question also reflects, I think, that this seems at first glance to be the least value laden. But I'd like to ask you to question that assumption. Because in truth, our choices about how we produce food have direct and profound implications, not only for what kinds of food we can produce, but how much of that food we can produce, and for whom that food is ultimately available. Now we live and consume in a context where we are, by and large, oblivious to the stories behind most of the foods that we eat. And because we so rarely have an adequate basis for making informed choices, we make assumptions based on intuition and good intentions about the sustainability of different ways of producing food, of different technologies for producing food. We tend to believe that sustainable food production looks like this. This is my farm. Aesthetically, it's beautiful. For me, it provides the connections to food that I want for my family. For my customers, it provides them with storied food, food that they can at some level relate to and connect with. This is the stuff of dreams for foodies and local vores. But is it a viable, is it a realistic model for sustainably feeding the world? 100 years ago, the average Canadian farmer produced enough food to feed 10 people. Today, that same farmer feeds over 120 people. Within this century, we need our farmers worldwide who are dwindling in proportion to produce enough food to feed half again as many people, more than 70% of which will live in urban centers by 2050. 
So it might be reasonable to idealize farms like mine, to idealize small-scale, low-intensity, localized production and consumption as a model for sustainable food production if our population was half a billion people strong and stable. But it is not. We are seven billion people strong and growing. I love my farm, but I am a conflicted farmer because I know that farms like mine, that farmers like me cannot, will not feed the world, not even close, unless we are willing to radically tackle the population lever through concerted investments in education and empowerment of women in developing countries, which we clearly should. And unless we are also willing to radically change what and how much we consume and reduce how much we waste, which we also clearly should, we have to stop pretending that farms like mine are a viable strategy for feeding the world. We do not have the land or the water or the environmental assimilatory capacity that is necessary to produce sufficient food in this manner. We cannot look backwards for solutions to the challenge of feeding the future. We have to look forwards. Now, this is not intended as a carte blanche for industrial agri-food systems. We can sing the praises of modern food systems for a variety of reasons, productivity, variety, affordability, food safety, and we can find a lot to criticize. We can do better, and we have to do better. But if technology is to be our only recourse, then it is absolutely imperative that we prioritize highly efficient strategies for food production based on the best available technologies that may actually give us a fighting chance of sustainably feeding seven, and then nine, and then 12 billion people. So what options, what strategies are at our disposal that could potentially help us to meet that challenge of sustainably intensifying and expanding agricultural production? First, precision agriculture and biotechnology will be critical to continuing to increase the efficiency of crop and livestock production in face of climate change. The use of remote sensing, big data, and related technologies that enable us to tailor nutrient delivery, irrigation, and pest management at the micro scale will be among the most important variables in sustainably intensifying traditional agriculture. Second, we can also expect what are often called disruptive technologies will precipitate profound changes in how we produce and consume food. Things that were in the realm of science fiction not long ago will likely become tomorrow's normal. Already, advances in renewable energy and material science are opening up opportunities to produce food in highly controlled environments where we can close nutrient cycles, exclude pests, recycle water, shorten supply chains, and reduce wastes. Third, we can also anticipate that the role of many traditional foods in our diets will be increasingly challenged by new kinds and forms of food. Five years ago, we were collectively scandalized by the world's first hamburger made entirely from in vitro cultured animal protein. Alternative protein technologies will become major competitors in the food space. At the same time, blockchain and similar technologies will enable a new kind of transparency with respect to the stories of the foods that we eat. Now, for many, this will not be the most intuitively appealing vision for the future of food, nor the most romantic. But romantic feeds very few of us now, and it will not feed the future. Food stands at the center of so many of our sustainability challenges. Food also stands at the center of our well-being. 
We cannot do without it. And it is incumbent on all of us as voters, as consumers, as participants in society to engage in this reflection, to engage in a social discourse, to demand better, to support better. Time may be an arrow with one direction, but there are multiple possible trajectories towards our common future. We have the luxury and the awful responsibility of choosing among worlds that might be. Isn't it time that we put our options on the table? Thank you.